So we, we want to right, understand these business cycle fluctuations. To do that, we need to figure out how the wage behaving on the business cycle, how the wage is going to respond to our shocks. But many things can happen. You, know, you have a pricing function that gives a wage between worker and firm, but many pricing functions are possible. So we need to look at the empirical evidence. So let's, let's dive in a little bit and see uh, what type of evidence we have on uh, wage setting in real labor markets because we're going to use that to build our pricing function. So, uh, let's see, there's some evidence here. Okay. So what could be determinants of wages on the labor market? So a first possible um, determinant of uh, wages on the labor market are institutions that are here to set wages. Okay. Uh, so you could have an institutional story, uh, institution that determine wages. Okay. And on the labor market, the key institution that's going to uh, affect wages, uh, it's um, unions, of course. Uh, so, when you think about the labor market and you think about what could be a determinant of, of wages, of course, um, so unions always, um, always come to mind. Labor unions that bargain with firms to set wages. Um, so, um, so, here we have data. So, these are data for the US. So this is just showing you how union membership has evolved over time in the US. And so actually unions haven't been always present. Uh, labor has started to organize at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so you know, workers realized that they were disorganized. Um, firms were getting bigger and bigger. They were having more and more power. And um, they were exploiting workers. So working conditions were very hard. Uh, pay was very low. And so workers starting to organize to try to have more power uh, to negotiate with firms. Um, so that started in the early 1900. So you can see that in 1930, um, union membership in the US was still not very high, only 12%. But unionization, so 1930, historically, you have to remember that's the beginning of the Great Depression. Um, so really difficult time um, for workers in the US. Um, so after the Great Depression, there was really a push to increase unionization. And so you can see the peak of unionization uh, happened roughly in the mid-50s, where about one third of the labor force uh, was unionized in the US. That's not very much. If you look at many European countries, uh, unionization was much more prevalent. And you have some uh, European countries where unionization um, was almost 100% uh, of the labor force. Uh, but in the US, it has never been the case. Um, so you can see the peak was roughly one third of the labor force was unionized. And after that, unionization started to fall. And you can see in recent years, unionization was back at around 10%, uh, so what it was in the 30s. Uh, so we would expect you know, unions have much less power today uh, than uh, they used to have um, you know, uh, at the just after uh, just after World War II. Uh, but nevertheless, in some industries, unions are quite important. And even if few people are unionized, the fear of unionization uh, may drive firms, you know, to behave as if they were unions. You know, even if their workers are not unionized. Um, so, what's the impact of unions on wages? Well, we know that unions try to uh, negotiate with firms to have better working conditions. But what they also try to do is to push uh, wages up. Um, and well, not only that, and they also strive to equalize wages uh, across all workers within firms. So if you have unions, you would expect wages to be uh, less different across workers because they try to have uh, you know, pay scales that are very transparent so that 
people know in different jobs what everybody else is paid um, and so on and so on and so forth. So um, if you have a union, you would expect uh, less pay inequality. So you would have more pay equality and you would also expect higher wages just because uh, unions negotiate hard for higher wages. Um, and in fact, we have evidence of that. So this is showing you um, this is showing you different industries. That's again for the US. Um, so this is showing you different industries for the US. It's telling you the size of each industry. So that's in the second column here. The number of employed in thousands. And it's telling you the number of uh, these work, the fraction of these workers that's unionized. That's here. So the number of uh, workers that are unionized, and then it's giving you the wage ratio. The wage ratio is def defined here. The wage ratio is the ratio between a union wage and a non-union wage. So when your wage ratio is above 100, it means that union workers are paid better than non-union workers. When your wage ratio is below 100, it means that um, work uh, union workers are paid less than non-union workers. And so what I told you is that in many industries, uh, unions are able to bargain wages up with firms and you know, they, they push wages up. So uh, what that means is that in many industries, the wage of union workers is higher than the wage of non-union workers. And we see that here. So on average in the private sector, you can see it here, the uh, wage ratio is 122, which means that wages in the, for union workers is, are 22% higher than when wages for non-union workers. In the government sector, same thing. Uh, union workers are paid about 20% more than non-union workers. So having unions in a certain industry or labor market is going to have an impact on your wages. And so then you can see that different industries have um, kind of unions have different impact in different industries. So here you can see, for instance, in construction, unions have a lot of power. Union workers are paid 50% more than non-union workers, and so that's quite large. You can see here something interesting that uh, the unions seem to uh, still have a, quite a big role in, in, go in the government sector. Um, so more than one third of government employees are unionized, whereas the private sector here, um, the role of union is much smaller, you know, less than 10% of workers are, are unionized. Um, so in construction, you have wages that are much higher. You can see in manufacturing wages are a little bit more, little bit higher for the unionized worker, just 7% higher. Transportation wages are 23% higher. Education, healthcare, you have wages that are you know, about 15% higher for union workers. Um, you do have some industries where actually union workers are paid less. So for instance, uh, this is a bit surprising, the finance uh, sector, union workers are paid 10% um, less than non-union workers. Um, that's you know maybe not so surprising um, you know, because in, uh, and you know mind you um, <laughs> the unionization rate is immensely low in finance it's only one person so it's possible that the workers that are unionized in finance are different than the other workers and, and paid less um, you know you can imagine that traders and um, you know, stockbrokers and so on are not uh, are paid a lot but are not unionized um, so it's possible that maybe the people who are unionized are actually people who are uh, further down. Um, the job ladder, um, and that's why their wages are lower. Um, but um, anyway, so a possible uh, source of wages in the labor market would be unions, especially in industries where unions are uh, powerful or where the threat of unionization is credible. Uh, and if we have unions, we know that wages are going to be fairly stable and they may be higher than they would be uh, otherwise. Uh, so, you know, of course, here we're building a model for the entire labor market. So, you know, we can try to take into account that there is some unionization. If maybe in your research project or just in your research in general, you want to adapt your model to a specific industry and that industry uh, happens to have uh, a lot of unionization, then you would want to tailor your pricing function to capture the bargaining uh, situation between unions and firms. Um, 